Japan up close. There are several reasons that art projects, especially the large rural art festivals, are becoming popular in Japan or have become popular in Japan. And the the interesting thing about them, I think, is that they're somewhat unique to Japan. So I think it's a good question to ask why、uh, they've become such a prominent feature of the. Kind of landscape for the contemporary art world in Japan, but not as much as other places.、Uh, so there are a few reasons. One is partly random, I suppose, in that there was, I think, the paradigmatic first case of a large rural art festival in Japan is the Echigo Tsumari Art Triennial that's held in Niigata Prefecture、uh, in Tokamachi in, pre- in Niigata Prefecture. Every three years since the year 2000, when that festival started in the year 2000, there had been experiments in rural areas in con, but you know, undertaken by contemporary artists before that. But that was the first attempt at a fairly large-scale international art festival in、um, in a very rural area,、um, agricultural area in Japan. And that festivals, frankly, struggled for the first couple of iterations. The 2000 festival and the 2003 festival were not really very well received in the Japanese art press. Art critics were not that impressed with it.、Um, the local population was not accepting of the idea of an art festival.、Um, they were some sometimes actively hostile, <laughs> but、um, even if not hostile, just quite disinterested、um, when. Kitagawa Furam, who's the the founder of the Echigo Tsumari Art Triennial, was,、uh, you know, he held hundreds of meetings in the area with local people to、uh, drum up support, answer questions, etc. about the festival in the kind of couple of years before the first one. But even though he held all of these meetings, there were only a handful of hamlets that agreed to cooperate with the festival programming and host artworks. So, it's not a foregone conclusion that these large-scale art festivals were going to be successful. It just happens to have played out that the Echigo Tsumari Triennial kind of turned a corner. People usually think of the 2006 festival as being a sign that it was sustainable, that it could succeed as an art event. And yeah, since 2006, it's steadily grown. And、uh, in the 2010s, when it kind of reached a, I guess, kind of steady state to an extent, the attendance、uh, when they were holding the festival, the attendance at the festival was over half a million visitors, which is very large for an art event.、Uh, it's one of the largest art events in the world. The Venice Biennale, for instance, gets about half a million visitors when they have a, a Biennale. So,、um, as an art event, especially in Japan, where there's not, there hadn't really been much of a popular awareness of contemporary art, or much of a kind of mass market. For contemporary art, in terms of viewers, not necessarily buying works, but going to see、um, a show, there really wasn't that much awareness of it.、Um, but with these large-scale art festivals, and starting with Echigo Tsumari, there have been more and more、um, domestic tourists, you could say, or domestic fans of art, art lovers、uh, in Japan of contemporary art as well. So I think. That this format, for whatever reason, appealed to、uh, appealed to people, appealed to a broader,、um, more diverse audience than a typical museum would.、Uh, I don't really, I don't know exactly why that is, but I would guess that the prospect of kind of walking outside in a rural area, it's very family friendly. It's、um, you know there's a lot of other experiences that are mixed in with the experience of seeing contemporary artworks, so I think it's a more accessible format. And you know by the late 2000s, this had proven itself as a format. 
And, and I think another big step in solidifying the attraction of the large scale art festival was that in 2010, the Seto Uchi uh, Triennale starts up and the founder of that, I'm not sure if we could say Kutake, I think is the founder of, of the uh, Seto Uchi uh, art festival. And he hired Kitagawa to be the director of that festival as well. So Kitagawa from became a kind of leader in uh, of this kind of large scale rural art festival. The, and really from 2000, I would say the decade of the 2010s is really kind of a peak for these festivals. Um, Kitagawa himself was directing a handful, I don't know the exact number, but in a given year might be directing two or three of them. I remember when I visited Japan in 2018, I visited the Echigotsumari Art Triennial that year, and I can remember talking to colleagues that that year that there were so many summer art festivals in sort of far-flung areas of Japan that people couldn't get to all of them, even, you know, Art, art professionals couldn't get to all of them. So I think because of the success of Echigo Tsumari, this format has become popular with audiences. Uh, it's become popular with local governments who are looking for a creative new way to try to um, generate some interest or some growth in, in rural communities that don't have a lot of other resources to, to kind of work with. Um, and to some arguably, I mean, depending on who you ask, I've, they've, they're popular with some artists and also I think with some art critics who value a place, uh, a role for art that's a little bit closer to people's daily lives than often comes through from like a gallery setting or a typical museum setting. So I think that uh, the success of of an actual art festival in a rural area with Echigo Tsumari was kind of kind of the biggest thing that made it such a such a attractive format in the 2010s, and it really has become a major feature of contemporary art field uh, in contemporary Japan. And another shift is relates to that is institutional shifts in the art world. Uh, in Japan. Uh, Japan's art world, there are actually several fairly divided art worlds. So for instance, the art world for uh, pottery uh, and ceramics is its own thing. Uh, the art world for um, Nihonga is its own thing. The art world for oil painting is its own thing. And contemporary art is kind of its own separate art world. But within the world of contemporary art, you know, uh, museums are, are quite important, have been important historically. But in the 19, from the 1990s, actually maybe from about the 2000s, about the time when Echigo Tsumari starts up, there's also um, a defunding of uh, museums in f throughout most of Japan. Um, Post-1990, with the bursting of the economic bubble, and fiscal tightening um, kind of across the board. A lot of the funding that had been used for arts funding, especially at the prefectural level, dries up. So a lot of um, arts funding had come from prefectures that would use kind of block grants from the national government. However, a lot of that money that was used by prefectures through the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s was not really used for supporting artists' work per se. It was used mostly for building art museums and concert halls. So it was used for building like infrastructure. And that created a phenomenon that people tend to call kind of the empty box of a museum that like really big, quite, quite beautiful museums in a lot of cases were built in places that, and they didn't actually have a collection that they were holding or didn't really have a clear mission in their locale, didn't have a, a, a relationship with an audience in where they were built. So those kinds of like the soft side of what a museum might mean to a community or as a place that supports kind of ongoing work by artists that wasn't really thought through uh, in that paradigm. So as the funding dried up, um, say post 2000, it's gradual process. 
um, you know, the museum building uh, slows down and 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 gradually stops, but there arguably more attention has shifted towards programming, towards artistic expression, and towards supporting actual artists. Um, ar arguably, the uh, kind of system that has been emerging that host sort of museum still relies on museums. It's not like museums are disappearing, but museums are also trying to find ways to establish more robust and meaningful relationships with their local communities, and also to try to get more actively involved in supporting living artists and not just kind of focus on collecting the works of dead artists. So um, the kind of format that the art festival uh, has pioneered I think is uh, kind of fits with, is friendly to these shifts, that kind of uh, uh, reduction of, of funding that's available for the kind of big ticket institutional investment in terms of museums. And some, some increase in the attention on the specifics of like the usership of, uh, of the museum and also the the people who are producing artworks. So there's that shift as well that I think has um, kind of been synchronous with, uh, symbiotic with the, the rise of rural art festivals. Um, then finally, and then I'll let you, uh, we can move on to the next question, but the, the final uh, and most important kind of uh driver that i so the the one that, and the one that's most interesting to me i guess i would say which is and it's the reason then that i call it the most significant um is that i think that the that art festivals are answering to and exploring a rea a contemporary reality that is not really been explored thoroughly and as exploring questions that haven't really been answered very convincingly, which have to do with the end of growth, the end of economic growth as a kind of direction or a common project that like brings the whole country together. And uh, the growing awareness of a need for sustainable sustainability in food systems in energy systems the awareness that you know the planet's resources are not infinite that economic growth is unsustainable for the planet and that also it hasn't played out well for local environments as well a lot of the time around japan so i think that uh there's more and more young people are kind of realizing that they don't want to sacrifice themselves to a kind of grind of professional urban existence. Um, and when the economy, if, 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 and I guess it's kind of a big, if the, the idea of growth has been kind of a foundation for modern modernization for modern modernity. And if we are moving beyond a paradigm, a growth, paradigm or a world that's organized around growth, I think that there's a lot of things that haven't been worked out about how human societies and cultures are going to work. But so if we are moving post growth, I think that there's, there's a need and people are feeling the need for values and approaches to life that are that are about sustainability, that are about uh, healthy living, uh, that are about caring communities. So, uh, you know, uh, building uh, relationships with other people that are not instrumental, that don't hinge on sort of making money together or one person paying the other, but are sort of more kind of life cycle length um, and uh, sort of more richly integrated across different spheres of life. So um, not so much separation between a workspace and a living space, say. Um, but also I think that there's still a desire for cosmopolitan communities. Like people um, maybe have, a, have a, a, an idea, a feeling that they, they don't want to, that they're not uh, sort of sustained spiritually by kind of modern urban life. But on the other hand, nobody really wants to move back to a, a farming village circa 1900. <laughs> Nobody wants to be like, you know, plowing the field behind a mule, I don't think, uh, or or living in an environment where they can't sort of communicate with people outside. So 
Uh, I think that there's certainly people don't want to give up the cosmopolitan side of urban life, but with like, you know, the internet and with so many, the, the um, travel infrastructure in Japan is so fantastic that, you know, it's possible to stay connected. It's possible to have a cosmopolitan community, even in sort of the middle of the mountains somewhere in Shikoku. Um, so th I think that with modern technology and kind of some of the benefits of, of modernization, um, it's possible to kind of have maybe the best of both worlds. Um, but also that, you know, cosmopolitan, but also highly local. So I think that local in the sense of like people living in a particular community are putting thought and care into that local area. Um, first and foremost, that they're not kind of living half of their life somewhere else. Um, and uh, along with all of these, I think that there's an interest in finding ways of life that might draw from kind of traditional practices um, that have been devalued with, with modernization and modernity. Um, you know, values of uh, fr frugality, of not living beyond your means, of collaborative work and communal work, and um, reviving some indigenous, for instance, like farming practices. Um, there's a kind of a guru of uh, permaculture, um, Fukuoka Masanobu. Uh, he's a agriculture. He's a farmer, but also thinker, writer. That's uh, kind of become globally known, but certainly very popular in Japan. But he has this idea of uh, um, no work uh, farming, kind of let nature sort of um, show you how it works and try to sensitize yourself to natural patterns um, as a way to farm, to harvest uh, for your needs in a way that like takes less energy from yourself and takes less energy from the environment. Um, and I think a lot of people see this as a sort of less intensified, less industrialized approach to agriculture. So I think that that sort of less industrialized, um, uh, less extended and specialized, uh, more local and um, sort of more holistic kind of lifestyle is something that a lot of people are really hungering for uh, in the present day and even more so post COVID as people kind of examine, you know, the big meaning of, of, of how they're spending their lives. Um, and I think that rural art festivals are, are, are one, one kind one part of the uh, process and kind of one kind of interface point where people who are curious about that kind of lifestyle can explore it, where people who are creative, but maybe don't have a good way of, finding a place to live in a rural area can participate and maybe find a space to commute from on, you know, on the weekends or something. So I think creates a point where people can uh, get information, get experience, come back and forth to an extent, and also sort of intellectually or sort of in the mind, um, suggest or provoke certain kinds of imagination just what what ifs um you know what what if we can find a way to live um in uh communities that that aren't uh intensely built up and covered with concrete and and glass um and uh people can rely on themselves and sort of grow their own food and find ways to make their own culture and not be so dependent on sort of globally extended supply chains, et cetera. <laughs> so I think that there are kind of, there's the potential I sense right now that the, you know, many developed com countries are uh, kind of fumbling uh, through a turn uh, away from from the the trends of modernization and modernity, but, there, but there's a lot of, um, question marks there's a lot of uh, just sort of unknowns about how how society will will transform or if it can i think towards uh forms of life that are that that might be more uh humane uh, humanistic than kind of industrialized modernity there's definitely rough 
connections or <laughs> kind of rough translations, imperfect translations, I think, between rural art festivals and the, sorry, let's say top 1% of global contemporary art. <laughs> You're right that, that you mentioned uh, urban areas in Japan, like Tokyo and Kyoto, Osaka, even more than that, kind of the dominance, the hegemony of New York or uh, the Venice Biennale that I mentioned or Documenta in Germany. So Europe and the United States remain, uh, even, even amidst a lot of efforts, ongoing efforts to um, globalize and diversify contemporary art, it still remains that taste is sort of made uh, in in the US and Europe. So in that sense, Japan's art world has um, always been, I think, from that perspective, seen as being on the outskirts, uh, which has uh, put Japanese artists in sort of a, a difficult uh, position. I think that the marginalization of non-Western countries and cultures has gotten better over the years for sure, but it still exists to an extent. And I think that the kinds of artwork that appear in art festivals in Japan are generally speaking, not that provocative or interesting to the elite of a global contemporary art world. Um, that has, I think that that can have several, there is probably several reasons behind that, but I would say that the growth of the art festivals is attributable primarily to a growth in interest in among domestic audiences, first and foremost. Um, and one could say that because the Echigo Tsumari Art Triennial is not that well known on the kind of global calendar of biennials and triennials. And the Seto Uchi Art Triennial is also not, it's it's a bit better known, but is also maybe not in the top tier of biennials and triennials. So we could definitely observe that. And I think that there's also a, uh, certain sectors of the contemporary art world in Japan that don't really like rural art festivals that much um, and don't really see them as generators of the most refined or the most experimental um, approaches to contemporary art and see them more as being more populist. Um, and I think that that critique is valid if one is looking for the latest um, most impactful work uh, that for whatever reason catches a global taste or a, a global moment of some kind. Um, I think though that I sense that uh, contemporary art itself is fracturing to an extent, kind of like the media market, you could say, is fracturing with the growth of, you know, Netflix and um, uh, Disney Plus and, you know, there's all of these streaming options as less of a kind of consolidated hierarchy. Um, and I think in contemporary art as well, there is still something of a hierarchy in terms of the hegemony of New York and Europe, but it's, it's, it's kind of... Uh, entropy is taking effect. I think it's flattening slowly. And contemporary art has become more of a a format or a form of expression that's available to more people. I think that it's become less of an elitist space and less of an elitist practice. And to some extent, less of a specific practice. It can include uh, video, music, performance, vi visual works, paintings, sculptures. Uh, but it has become, I think, a, 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 a more accessible kind of thing, either to enjoy or to participate in making, to collaborate in making. Um, so that accessibility, I think, yeah, it's definitely 
uh, criticized from certain quarters. And I think that the, uh, you know, the global art world moves in its own ways and not everything appears at that level. Uh, but I don't think that's necessarily a negative. I think it's just sort of a, a different idiom, uh, a different way of being for, for artwork. Personally and professionally, I'm a fan of art festivals. Um, my own work, uh, uh, both my research and also kind of my tastes, I am uh, interested and in, in affirmative of a certain kind of populism um, rather than uh, discovering the art form that is sort of unique and irreproducible. I'm much more interested in art forms that are reproducible and participatory and that uh, many people can enjoy variations of. So the orientation of the art festivals is something that I find myself fundamentally resonating with. And I think that the, uh, from my perspective, one of the main drawbacks is the kind of formulaic nature that of them. It's not really the nature of them, but they've become more formulaic as the Echigo Tsumari paradigm has kind of become a format. And especially as Kitagawa himself has, has uh, been asked to be the director of so many different festivals. Uh, I think it would be more interesting, I think necessary for there to be more variety and experiment, organizationally speaking, um, and, you know, tries uh, uh, different attempts um, about what kind of artworks are possible, what kind of temporality is possible, is a festival the best format in terms of like, you know, two months out of every three years, is that, uh, is that, the, is that the best way to... Um, to think about the con contribution or potential contribution of art to a particular community. So I think that there are um, problems and limitations sort of on the margins, but generally speaking, I'm, uh, I'm uh, kind of optimistic about, about them, about art projects, at least maybe as a step, maybe there'll be other steps beyond them. At the same time, I'm not pessimistic about museums. I think that it's really important, really important to uh, for the state and for um, private funders as well to continue to support museums. And I think that one of the the you know great unsung treasures of um, you know small mid sized cities around Japan are their libraries and their museums. Uh, they're really uh, great community resources, and uh, those, it, you know, it doesn't have to be an either or between, say, art festivals, art projects, and museums. Um, uh, that these other kind of existing elements of the institutional landscape, I think, are a really important legacy. Uh, even community centers, you know, Kominkan, I think it's important for people to recognize the kind of rich legacy that that already exists. Uh, and these can also be kind of staging points and resources for the kind of, uh, you know, experimental programming, maybe artists in residence or a kind of collaborative project with, with local citizens on something that, um, yeah, that, that I think that there's a way to kind of take the the attitude that maybe was at the beginning of art festivals and break break up break it up and find find ways to experiment with it in in different scales and and different uh, different forms. But basically, I'm but yeah, very interested and optimistic, and I think that there's a lot of uh, change. Uh, a lot of transformation yet to happen. This is really just kind of some of the first stages. Japan up close.